Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? My name is Anna, and I'm going to be your host and facilitator for today's event. And I'm just going to come right out and say it. I am just so honored to be in the presence of such warriors today, because as we all know, COVID is indeed a steep uphill battle, and the medical supplies industry plays a frontline role in it. So it's just such an honor to be here today. And I'm also so happy to announce that the industry is overwhelmingly represented here today with attendees from different parts of the globe. That is wonderful. So our webinar for today is, of course, a tip of the hat to your esteemed trade, but it is also an acknowledgement of the crossroads we're in at this moment in history and how we can emerge victorious at the end of it all. And so it is my great privilege to welcome you all to J-Curve's Leveraging Technology to Rewrite the Rules of the Medical Supplies Industry. Welcome welcome. We're happy to be well attended by stakeholders in the industry because today a pair of top shelf thought leaders are sharing insights and also recommendations and forecasts that will ensure the continued success of your business. Of course, we're always thinking about you. Just a reminder, you can go ahead and share what you're learning here today in real time to your respective Facebook or your LinkedIn accounts by using our official hashtags. We only have two. That's hashtag JCurve leveraging technology and also hashtag optic by JCurve. You can also fill up the feedback form for a chance to win Amazon gift voucher. So I, if I were you, I'd get to that right now. Winners will be announced via email. So. In a nutshell, our program for today intends to help you meet disruptions in the medical supplies industries head on. Our speakers will touch on key trends that are making a real impact, as well as discuss how cloud technology can help you build the right roadmap, also mitigate risks, and ultimately be on a continuous ascent in business, especially and specifically at this time when that ascent is getting threatened by a host of different factors. As for our featured thought leaders, we are just so thrilled to say that apart from being some of the most decorated in their respective fields, with their expertise, we will hopefully come out of this webinar with a different mindset, a mindset of not playing an outdated game, but instead rewriting the rules of that game through technology. But before we formally kick off today's proceedings, allow me please to give you a very brief background regarding our hosts for today, J-Curve and also together with JD Healthcare Group. JD Healthcare Group is a distributor of healthcare products across multiple sectors throughout Australia, servicing hospital aged care, emergency services, and also allied health, and represents over 40 unique manufacturers from all over the world. JD Healthcare Group specializes in the safe manual handling of people, also providing services and solutions that minimize occupational risks associated with patient care, especially for the unable, the disabled, and the obese. JD Healthcare Group has distribution centers at its head office in Sydney, as well as in Melbourne. 
Now, let's get to J-Curve. J-Curve is a leading edge cloud technology solutions company that provides enterprise resource planning business management software, also telecom expense management and service management, and also digital marketing solutions for your businesses. So today, J-Curve is even more resolute in its goals of, that's right, advancing ambition for you your businesses and your customers the best way it knows how by leveraging digital transformation to improve services, fine tune workflow, and ultimately succeed in the market. The managing director for JD Healthcare Group, Etienne Rees. Etienne? Oh, thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. Um, it will be my pleasure. I'll, I'll go through a couple of slides that I've got that I've got prepared and you know, um, kind of by way of almost re-extending a little bit of that introduction. I might, I might just go through a couple of key points just to add a little bit of context into who we are again, who I am, and, and ultimately what we've done. Uh, as you rightfully said, over the last year, this has been a, an immensely challenging year for us as industry globally. Um, the amazing part about this, obviously, as what global pandemics bring, is that the whole world is speaking about one particular common topic, and that's COVID. Um, what we do need to figure out is obviously not just the current situation that we're in, what we've done in the past, but probably more importantly, is what does the new normal look like and how do we move outside of that um, as we go forward? So allow me to, um, to share, share the screen. So just very quickly, um, as you said, so leveraging technology to rewrite the rules. Uh, we've obviously got a first of all, start off on a base plate to be able to understand what the current rules are for us to be able to rewrite the rules. So we'll have a look at some of those factors that, that do influence where we are currently today. So very, very briefly, just as you were saying, of the three years roughly in the medical supply biotechnology space that I've done, I've worked with uh, various multinationals in, in multiple markets and some of the bigger bigger companies, the likes of Medtronic, Incovidia and Tyco, which I've done. and. Um, I've been in Australia, originally from South Africa, but I've been in Australia for the last nearly 15 years. And um, over the last seven of those, I've really tried to become a little bit more focused towards Australian companies. How do we ultimately have a look to see how do we leverage research and development, engineering, um, and, and ultimately be able to, to create a healthcare environment that is really localized, taking globalization, obviously, and forming a local market around that. But generally with keen interest really in, in theatre, in, in pharmaceuticals, in allied health, which is really where I've spent most of my most of my time. But as such, for for for, uh, for where I'm currently at is with JD Healthcare Group. Uh, it's been a very interesting journey that we've had with JD Healthcare originally as a company that's been in operation for well over 20 years. Um, really starting off with understanding and supplying products that met the need of in particular a growing population where people are getting larger. And one of, the, one of the key areas of our business, as you rightfully were saying, was how do we move people? How do we ultimately um, you know, take people that are not able to assist themselves either through disease or through aged care, um, you know, or obviously just through healthcare break, you know, requirements, being in theatre, how do we move people around? Um, and it's not necessarily around the end user, so to speak, which is the patient, but our focus really relies on who our core immediate customer is. How do we deal with doctors and nursing staffs in order to be able to make their work environment safer? And then obviously as a result, the patient has a safer environment too. So we're, a, we're an importer, we're a, we're a supplier, we're a distributor. Um, as you said, we supply into the hospital, into the aged care emergency services market. And we've got an interesting business setup, which is quite important because we're, we're largely a direct to customer market. We are recently gone through a, a multi uh, company merger, which took place at the end of um, the previous financial year um, to really establish ourselves as a national footprint to be able to meet the customer's needs a little bit better in our particular market. We've got two other businesses, both of which are very strong e-commerce businesses. And that's quite important as well, because it does change the way in which we engage with our customers across multiple levels. So the question isn't necessarily who we are or what we do, but the large part of the question is how do we go about doing that business? So I'd like to create this framework over here, which really talks about the factors and that, that ultimately shape the constraints and shape the options for an organization 
and how these factors ultimately, are they impact what we do or how we do or how we are impacted by those particular areas. And we need to understand this, like what we said, particularly in the current environment and certainly COVID has taught us a lot, but certainly how we're moving forward and how do we employ the likes of technologies in order to be able to respond to the needs of a changing market. So certain things that we know when we start looking at obviously your products and services, it's the actual factor of the items that we have that's on exchange. What are we doing and how are we going about being able to acquire um, you know, an exchange revenue obviously for products and services that ultimately make us successful? All right, we look at the labor, so the three elements, right? So the labor that we look at is obviously the people that we employ. What are we doing? to attract good people, not how are we going about it. How we go about it, you might put a post on, you know, a job seeker or you might put it onto LinkedIn to kind of go, this is, we're looking for somebody. The question is, what are you doing in order to be able to attract people? And often in particularly in the digital space where people will actually have an insight into your business. They'll actually see what your business is doing and how you're performing. Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on the social media platforms? Um, you know, so, and in that way, by establishing yourself in a good, in a good frame, you know, you're more likely to attract more people that are actually wanting to be part of your organization. So that's a key point. The capital market ultimately, which I like to put down, which is the funding mechanism as to when people choose to spend money, what are you doing that makes them want to spend that money with you? If we live in a world of parallel universes as such like this, where we've got products that are very similar between competitor one and competitor two, what at the end of the day, is the driving factor that makes that customer choose you over your competitor. Assuming prices are relatively similar and products are relatively similar, why you? What is the differentiator? And certainly what we found over the time is that there's a couple of responses that we needed to go to the customers with. Um, you know, and technology at the end of the day does sit at the top of that. Hence also why we've merged as companies earlier in the, in the previous part of the year. We've got to remain cognizant of the two forces that come into effect. And we find that those forces ultimately ebb and flow. They move around those particular market factors that drive our behavior and more importantly, consumer behavior. We've got to stay cognizant of technological trends. And I'll touch on this probably a couple of times when we start looking at even the likes of web meetings and stuff. You know, many of us would have loved to probably have been invested in the likes of, uh, you know, this particular platform, you know, whether it's Zoom or, other things, when we knew COVID was gonna strike, right? We, we were suddenly locked up. What are those technological factors that we ultimately go um, and work within? What are our confines? And then having a look at the regulatory framework or even the lack of regulatory framework that ultimately can affect the way that we ultimately do business in the environment that we do business in. So let's explore that a little bit further. So we have a look at really the seven contextual factors that really are known to, to obviously affect the way in which we, we do our business. Um, I'll list these very quickly and, and very briefly, you can see that there's three that I've particularly highlighted, which I'll bring out onto the next point, but you've got to remain aware of these things. So we start looking at obviously global events. So again, these are contextual factors that, that influence and affect the way that we do business or have an effect that we can affect business in the future. Global events, look no further than our current environment, obviously with COVID. The way that the healthcare industry has needed to respond, the speed at which we needed to respond, not only from our perspective, which is obviously the output perspective, but being able to keep up with the demands that the supply market is able to obviously maneuver around. We start looking at obviously labor. Labor really talks about our people, for one, and the effects that this has on our people. We've certainly experienced Lockdowns, for example, how do we attract people to that particular area? Um, you know, the people that work for us. Technology, when we look at new innovation, uh, again, like what I said, this particular platform that we look at, the digitization of our businesses, the prevalence that we started seeing with e-commerce platforms obviously rising, where we're not able to, in certain markets, be able to gain access into shopping centers. How do we go online in order to be able to do um, our shopping? Um, and this even extends obviously outside of healthcare. But the question is, how do we, during this space, be able to connect with various people in healthcare in order to be able to keep transactions going? Um, and a good example of this would be your physiotherapists, for example. If they're not able to put hands on patients, how are they able to still acquire products in order to be able to continue doing the services without obviously um, in, in the absence of, of uh, 
uh, continuous uh, income. Um, we obviously look at uh, demographics, government interventions that we start looking at with regards to the lockdowns that we've seen, social needs and wants or, or social mores that we start looking at, is what are the behaviors that change the way that we're thinking about going to market? Um, technology, as we said, and then consumerism. And consumerism really becomes a big thing, right? Is how are we responding to the way that customers at the end of the day are defining in the way that we need to be able to respond as a supplier or as a manufacturer of, of goods. And like what we said, JD Healthcare in this perspective, although yes, we've got the end result, the end patient at the end of the day and their particular safety, best at heart, what we do need to really consider about is obviously how are we impacting the lives of our direct customers, which are the nurses and the doctors, so that they can do their job as well. So we really start having a look at the way that our consumers um, shape and shift the way that we ultimately operate in our business. So what, I'm, what I wanna do over here is, is take three of those events, like what you said, I'll put two topics into this, which is two of the top topics that certainly we start seeing in, in, where I am over here in Australia. Uh, needless to say, obviously COVID has changed the way that the world functions. So that's the first one. And we'll tie what I've just said over here and try and summarize it all together into one thing. So we look at the way that COVID has changed the world. And the second topic that's becoming quite hot, which is obviously the, uh, the COP26, net zero emissions. And what does this mean for us as a healthcare industry and how can we work within the new trend that's ultimately coming? So of the seven factors, contextual factors that we looked at, look at global events, social needs and wants, so social mores, and we have a look at the consumerism, all right? And these three things in particular, they're probably all very relevant, those three things in particular are and will shape the way that we ultimately think about our businesses moving forward. So if we break those down, global events, supply chain end to end, which we look at, all right, we're noticing that we obviously have got some confines with regards to raw materials. We know that face masks, personal protective equipment, all of that, that ultimately has taken over a lot of the raw materials. We've seen an increase in the pricing as such like this. And our customers are obviously at a point where they, they, they just don't want to take on extra price, uh, price increases. You know, we as an industry need to be able to move more rapidly, be a little bit more agile in order to be able to understand what our customers' needs are to be able to respond with the right products at the right time. We look obviously at global events with regards to consumers, the lockdowns and isolations. So you picture again, you've got a patient that typically would be able to go out and uh, do elective surgery that's gone through and, uh, and requires a particular product that they need. They're not able to do that, obviously, because of the COVID environment. How can you as a business be able to communicate with the customer on the first instance, and then ultimately ensure that a transaction goes through? An environmental awareness that we start looking at, particularly as the new generation starts coming through, we know and we can feel that there's a greater impact that is being, or um, shall I say, an expression, obviously, with environmental impact not just about carbon emissions and ultimately how and what we're using in order to be able to make products, but what are we doing at the end of life? So when a product ultimately has made it into the market, what are we doing in order to manage the end of life of that particular product? So we start seeing a lot more discussion taking place at a hospital level that relates to uh, recyclability, reusability of those, those particular products. Okay, and we'll come back to those in a sec. We talk about needs and wants. And this really talks about both of our needs as well as that of our customers. So when we look at the two sides to the screen that you can see with regards to the global events, what are the current environment that we're sitting in, the consumerism, which is how are these events ultimately translating in people's minds, their wants, their needs, their beliefs even, in how they're trying to gain products from us as suppliers. All right, we get left with this position in the middle where we take our needs and our wants, right, but we've got to be able to put that into action. We've got to find a product, we've got to bring the product into market, we've got to be able to sell the product and transact it, all right? And what we're noticing is obviously what we've made a big shift a couple of years ago when we moved over to the J-curve system, we needed a system that was more robust, we needed something that was bigger for us in order to be able to manage all three of our businesses, very particularly obviously our, our um, uh, the e-commerce trade businesses that we started looking at. Customers are acquiring uh, EDIs or electronic data interchanges. Their ability to be able to, at a customer level, in essence, have their systems talk to our systems 
so that they can manage their requirements and their ERP requirements uh, from their perspective. Um, and we started looking at transactions and reporting. So not only are we at a point where we're just pumping products out into the market and expecting people to buy, but we're really getting to a point where our customers are relying on us in order to be able to actually prove that we are as effective as, we're, as what we're saying we are. If we're trying to change the behavior, we're trying to change a new model in which a hospital, for example, might be adopting particular products or procedures, they want us to be able to go back and actually show them that what we set out to achieve is in fact changing in the scale that they wanted to do, particularly when we start looking at procedural and operational um, effects. And then obviously our accuracy and availability, and this was a key thing certainly for our company, is that inaccuracy costs money at the end of the day. And in healthcare, sometimes inaccuracy can, can, can be more than just money. It, 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 and in theory, depending on your business, it could actually cost um, the health or wellness or, or, or life even of a particular patient. Um, we, as a company, we employed uh, barcoding uh, and scanning capability into our warehouse, um, which we, we, we find to be exceptionally important and exceptionally valuable. We basically require our suppliers to us to be able to enable the products to be able to be bar scanned. So that when the product comes in, we know what's coming in, it integrates back into the system, it gets put to shelf and vice versa. When an order comes in, obviously, we're making sure that the right products are scanned uh, and sent out to the patient uh, or to the customer. If the wrong product obviously is being drawn, wrong scanned, and obviously not being connected to the actual purchase order, then obviously the system has a capability to be able to indicate as much, thereby reducing our costs, reducing any inaccuracies, the handling fees, um, all of the associated costs with postage and return postage as such in order to be able to make you not just a better organization, but a lot more credible organization. All right, another key ele element like what we said is that we deal with a lot of different suppliers and manufacturers from all over the world. And one of the strengths that we start looking at about the simplicity working with a system that provides us with multi-currency availability. If we are only effectively dealing in Australian currency as such, how do we ultimately also talk the financial languages about the euros or the US exchange? You know? So these are factors all tied together with regards to the seven contextual factors as we have put down, the influencing factors that really affect business or provide the options for us in which we need to operate. And it comes back to that first principle that I said, which is if all things are equal, why do customers choose you? And, um, you know, and, and we don't know, like what we said, we don't actually know what the, what the future is going to look like. But what we do know right now is that we can take the lessons learned from the COVID era, um, understand where our businesses could strengthen ourselves, to be able to reach customers, possibly even at a time when our sales force or the salespeople that typically would be in the field, when they're not able to go out and do their jobs, how else are we able to communicate with customers? And one of the key strong strength areas that we found, certainly with regards to our e-commerce businesses, again, is our ability to be able to, um, you know, is to communicate through, through our various systems, uh, through marketing, uh, direct communication, um, EDMs, direct mailers, and such like this. So very, very powerful. It's been fantastic being with JCurve over the last, uh, or, or NetSuite JCurve for the last year or two. Um, so it's been fantastic. And that's, that's me, and I hope I've come in within the time constraints that, constraints that, you, that you asked me to be. Thank you so much uh, for that, Etienne. That was really quite enlightening, amazing talk, and let me just say, a real eye-opener for all of us here. Now, we all know that the past two years really have affected pretty much every nook and cranny of the business world. But when it comes to an industry such as yours, the medical supplies industry, an essential player in the healthcare ecosystem, you just get a, a general view of things and feeling that there's more at stake and we cannot afford to take chances now how do you improve customer service that's one question how do you drive operational efficiency and ultimately how do you leverage technology to ensure revenue and growth now these questions and more are just being begging to be asked and un unfortunately for us yet again our keynote speaker is more than up to the task so please help me welcome back on our virtual stage the chief growth officer for jcurve mr arthur fernandez 
Arthur, the floor is yours. Thank you again, Anna. So I'm going to dive straight into it. Um, COVID has instilled a new urgency in for the restructuring of the global supply chain. Now that's on the grounds of operational resilience. Uh, Etienne has, you know, talked about a, a couple of points that he raised across that, and we'll probably dig a little bit deeper during our panel discussion. The underlying drivers that we have found is the, the cost arbitrage, okay, rising political risks, uh, the, the, the social values associated to uh, some of the drivers around that, the increasing cost of business interruption. So those are your natural disasters. And last but not least um, is the technology part. Now, what has been accelerated? I think I, I touched on that in the first word within this presentation, which is the accelerator has been COVID-19. Organizations have been making a move towards the digitization, but at a very slower space, et cetera. But in the last two years for COVID-19, in order to, um, to make those adjustments in the supply chain has accelerated that, that whole component. Now, where have we seen some of those adjustments? We've seen diversification in, uh, in the geographics of where uh, our customers are working, how they are working with their suppliers, how they're working with their customers. Uh, we're seeing a relocation of supply chains, okay? We're seeing a reshoring to customers. Essentially, organizations are moving parts of their businesses to where a majority of their customers are sitting. We're seeing um, simplified supply chains. And the last uh, part of that is we're actually seeing a, a bit of insurance and risk transfer solutions. So um, in order to counter affect some of those movements in the changes and the people and the relocation, the reshoring, et cetera. What I wanted to touch on was actually, if I just, sorry, that was one slide too many. I'm just gonna go back a little bit. Okay, not to worry. Um, on the technology part, we're seeing two major changes, or I'm seeing two major changes working with some of our customers and the, the conversations that we're having within Jacob Solutions. One is around 3D printing. Now, why 3D printing? The technology has, uh, you know, advances in industrial 3D printers now can handle rapid prototyping and small scale orders without sacrificing quality. Uh, that was not available before. Um, it allows the organization to have small quantity production and easier product differentiation. That's a key, key, key part of where now businesses now can need to survive. There's are many products out there, but the differentiation makes a big uh, change to that. Less massive production reduces the benefits of offshoring and manufacturing can now be closer to the customers. So that is deployment of smaller um, production houses or manufacturing houses into where most of your customers are sitting. Uh, production can take place with a minimum amount of labor. Human capital is less of an issue in the overall production of the costs. So, those are the, some of the points around where we're seeing from a 3D printing perspective and, and some of the advantages associated to that. The next one we, we, we're seeing is the use of robotics. We all know uh, with the changes, I think you walk around in some of your environments, you're seeing some of the robotics come up, okay? but robotics within the, the supply chain industry, within the manufacturing industry is increasingly um, being in demand. Now, Essentially, that's because the comparative advantage that emerging markets had in low skilled, low labor cost production is now eroding. Um, as routine, low skilled tasks are increasingly being automated. Right? Investment in, in robots reduces the contribution of labor in the value chain. It tilts, it's, it's now adjusting the cost benefit analysis against offshoring to low wage locations. Right. So we're seeing an increase in the, in the robotics. In, in the ASEAN market um, across Singapore, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, et cetera, we're seeing a lot more in 
organizations coming and talking to us about robotics, around 3D printing, and more specifically, how does that impact their supply chain and how that enhance their supply chain, but also how does that go back into understanding where their uh, customers, their production, and their final production and manufacturing costs. And that's all part of the, uh, the overall solutions coming out to play. I wanted to touch um, that what's driving the change, right? So driving the change is essentially social distancing, uh, having to work from home, restricted movement of people across borders, now resulted in the rise of, uh, in the demand of obviously information and communication technology, both in the hardware and in the software space. Now, in the software environment, the internet-based services are, are, are a key factor. We wouldn't be able to do this without, uh, you know, Zoom technology and remote stru structuring, the, the, the having the ability to have internet now. Now, those internet-based services, uh, solutions are moving towards subscription as a service. The key part of all of that is with, with the various data sources that's available, available across uh, your multiple channels, your multiple products, the date, how you manage your data is now an important factor, which is not only geographical uh, priorities and uh, data management or security of that data, but also how you're using that data to enhance your, uh, enhance your business essentially. And of course, last but not least is your people management, right? So people now sit, as I said, working from home, working from different locations, um, and, and essentially how does that all now comply into how your business now moves forward? I wanted to, uh, I wanna share a couple of questions that was undertaken by a recent survey by the uh, Economic, Economic uh, Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Now the data that you're about to see is more related to the ASEAN countries. So, um, and, and, you know, and, and hopefully it gives you an example of uh, where the changes are happening. So the question that was posed to the participants was, did your production locations change during 2020? If not, did they plan to change? And if they did make a change, um, when will the change be implemented and the reason for the change, right? So if we look at the numbers on the left-hand side, you'll see that 43% has already gone through a change or are doing under, uh, undertaking a, a plan to make those changes. 57% uh, still not sure or no plan to change. Now, out of the 43% that made that change and uh, the reason for change, majority of it was because of COVID-19. Otherwise, they would have taken a slower pace in making those changes across the use of technology, people, et cetera, over the next coming years. But as I stated in, uh, in, in the start of this presentation was COVID-19 has accelerated a lot of things and technology and the use of technology and the use of your data, your people uh, has increased across the, that, that usage. The second question, uh, one of the other questions that was raised was in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, what measures has the company taken regarding supply chain? Let's, let's do a little bit of a breakdown in those, in those numbers. So 63% took on the, you know, because it was due down to cost reduction and optimization. 53% uh, was because they needed to rebuild their relationships with the customer. 35% of that was actually to rebuild the relationship with their suppliers or create new supplier relationships. Obviously relating to all of that, uh, both rebuilding of the customer and rebuilding of your suppliers was essentially a supply chain network optimization. Uh, and that was 30% of uh, the overall you know, numbers where people looked at. Supporting all of that was actually the, the technology part. So 23% of that was digitalization in the supply chain. And in, in supporting that 23%, how they designed that technology use, how they designed the, the rebuilding the relationship and the supply and the customers was related to the remotely managed and enabled operations. So long gone are the days of operations within 
one particular country, but now sort of diversifying that out into smaller operations across geographic locations, supporting their customers uh, at, at that level. Driving the change uh, across all of this, uh, I'm just gonna put out one, one last slide for uh, to, to share on this is essentially people matters and people management and how you manage those people uh, to undertake your operations, the data and the integration points that sit within your organization. Now that all relates back up to what we call enterprise resource planning. Now, Jacob is a solution partner for Oracle NetSuite. Uh, we understand that you, know, you have many choices in ERP solutions. Um, so therefore, so why Oracle NetSuite? Because it's a software as a service. It's because it has the multiple uh, industry uh, areas. It, because it has multiple functionalities, your uh, finance, your CRM, your processes, your manufacturing, your production, all in one product, right? As I said, we, we understand you have many choices in ERP solutions. Myself and the team look forward to speaking to you on the pros and cons of Oracle NetSuite in the coming days. I hope you um, manage to take some talking points or some points out of my presentation and Etienne's presentation. And hopefully we'll, we'll get a few of those questions coming into, into the, uh, the panel. With that, I would say thank you for your time. Over to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Arthur. Well, that was as perceptive as perceptive gets. Actually, there's a lot of great takeaways in both your talk, uh, Etienne and yourself, Arthur. A lot to chew on, a lot to process, a lot to study for our friends in the medical supplies industry. Now, yeah, as you said, um, Arthur, um, they don't have to chew on it alone. We are here to answer questions that they may have, whether here during the webinar or after, because we do have our solutions experts at the ready to answer your questions. Um, so if you do have any questions at all, any clarifications from any of the aspect of the talk that we both uh, that we had today, go ahead and send them over to us and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Before we do move on, just a quick reminder, please don't forget to fill up your feedback form. This is for a chance to win Amazon gift vouchers. Uh, for you to know whether you won or not, you are going to have to check your email. So get to that before uh, the event uh, ends today. I don't know about you, but for me, it is reassuring hearing discussions of what can be done to address the realities on ground and also thrilling to hear projections about the possibilities of moving forward. So it is time for the fireside chat. So let me call back our speakers for the discussion. So Arthur and Etienne. I know. There you go. So I have you both on here. And at this point, gentlemen, I'm going to turn over the floor to you. Thank you again. Um, so Etienne, thank you for your uh, presentation. And I think you, you touched on uh, various points within that. Now, I would like to ask you to tell us a little bit about your journey across, uh, you know, from the, from the time that you decided to go into, you, you touch on J-Curve as a solution and you moved into sort of the wider product, you change your distribution model, et cetera. So talk, if you don't mind, can you talk through a, a little bit about the journey uh, with Jacob as well as the solution that we've put in place? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our journey, our journey has definitely been a, has been a quite a remarkable one. Like what I said, you know, we, we've gone, we've gone back to uh, pretty much uh, a, a relatively basic uh, structure of business where we, um, we we source good products, we pride ourselves in, in trying to source some of the best products that we could certainly find in the world without obviously being confined to the multinational discussion of what the best products in the world is because we're not tied to research and development. But we therefore bring in products into the country and quarter for the best parts of 20 years we utilized a very um, diverse distributor network in order to be able to really distribute our products. Um, and for any person that's been to Australia, or if you haven't been to Australia, Australia is a very complex country. Uh, we've got a very, very low population density. 
obviously we've got call it 25 million people across a continent that is the size of America or all of Europe. Um, you know, we've got four or five major cities in essence that constitute pretty much most of our population, but it's a, it's a good seven, 747 uh, flight between Sydney and Perth, east coast to west coast, similar to flying from New York to Los Angeles. All right, so, um, so, so that's, that's part, of the, part of the challenge that we had. And when, when you look at that, it makes it very, very hard for one single company to be able to really be effective in each one of those particular states that are so, so spread across. But we did that obviously through very good distributors in each one of those states. The problem when we started really sitting down and listening to, in particular, our private hospital network, where they made it very clear that for them who themselves are national, is a national healthcare footprint, that they really wanted one particular company to deal with, regardless of whether it is in Perth or all the way across into Sydney. Um, and hence that brought forward the challenge that we had of having different distributors that had the same product, but had that we were supplying to them, but had a different product code in Perth than what we had in Melbourne. And we had a different price in Sydney versus what we had in Brisbane, you know, and and this, this was the challenge that we needed to overcome. Um, and through the journey, like what I said, when we merged with, uh, with two of our partners earlier in, on in, in the previous year, you know, right at the start of COVID, by the way, which is a point of saying, what is this thing called COVID? It's just hit us. How do we move forward? And should we take the risk or shouldn't we? What is the bigger risk? Is it bigger to not do it or is it bigger to do it? And obviously, we made the decision to actually do that merger and become one national football. And we very much leveraged the utilization of obviously our ERP system. We originally were just on J-Curve, we then moved over to, 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 to the same NetSuite, I suppose, program that we did, just scaled it in order to be able to provide us with more functionality to meet exactly those needs. How are we able to transact nationally, keep consistent pricing, consistent products, you know, have possibly have different pricing tiers, depending on obviously on the type of customer we're dealing with. You know, how do we deal with both the direct business and the J, uh, JD Healthcare direct to hospital versus our two other more e-commerce slash direct businesses as well? Um, how were we able to do that? Um, and that was critical for us. Like what I said in, in the presentation, we then employed the barcoding capability for us to make sure that we weren't just a supplier, but that we were a good supplier. We reduced our error rate through those, through those efficiencies. We were able to do that, um, obviously, nationally. Um, so a very critical thing for us. I can't imagine that we would be having this very discussion with regards to the progress that we've seen over the last 18 months if we didn't have the backing of a good ERP system behind us. Um, and if I may add on to that, the part of it that, that we're really only now starting to really explore more and, and almost through necessity was our capability of doing our CRM side to that. So it's not just the ERP side to it, but really the CRM. How do we communicate with people about our products and services when our sales reps can't actually walk into the hospitals because of the COVID lockdowns? How can we communicate our products and our service offerings, you know, through, you know, direct emails to those particular customers based on the, the based on the, uh, the contact base that we ultimately have in the system? Great, thank you for that. So just, just for the sake of the audience, I think you touched on a, a couple of words there. One was J Curve and obviously Oracle NetSuite. Now, uh, just for the audience, um, so J Curve Solutions has a product called J Curve ERP, which is essentially targeted at uh, or works with the smaller businesses. And and I think as JD Healthcare, when when you originally started, you started off on that particular platform, but naturally transitioned into. Uh, the, I suppose the, uh, the, the parent of the Jacob BRP solution, which is Oracle NetSuite. And because of obviously your, your distributors that you brought on board, the way that you had to work your inventory and I suppose the whole complete supply chain and, and, and you know, distribution. And as you said, the, uh, the more components around the CRM and the capability around that as well. So just, just to kind of highlight that, I think that's the differentiation. So it was a seam, to my understanding, it was a seamless almost seamless uh, upgrade up into into that particular solution 
Well, right? you're right, and I'll and I'll and I'll tell you I'll tell you why as well. For, for there's a couple of factors. It's not it's not one particular factor, and, and I suppose through tragedy or otherwise, you know, I've been part of companies where we have ultimately migrated uh, migrated systems, and and you you can read about these things, and it can be it can be a challenge, um, you know. But when you combine good people that are driving and implementing the system with a good system, it it works well. You know, um, no no challenges without its no system is without, without its challenges. The question is ultimately how do you get a combination of people, implementation, the process of what you're trying to do, and you combine that all together to be able to come up with the least amount of challenges. Um, you know, and for us. Uh, I have a bit of a personal joke with our with our director of operations over here, who needed to implement moving from one previous system over to NetSuite or over to JCurve. It's gone through the whole migration to that, and then a year later we're kind of going, "Hey, actually, we we're actually moving up again. We're moving into the whole Oracle NetSuite. Let's just redo what you've just done a year ago." And and that that was quite quite flawless for us, you know. So she's done a really good job. That's great. Um, just shifting a, a little bit before we, we, we take any uh, questions from the panel, uh, assuming we have the time, is um, the environmental side. You, you touched, you know, COP26, you, you touched on net zero uh, mm -hmm. emissions. Now, tell, tell, me, uh, tell me what you guys are doing from that perspective. How are you changing your product? What, what does that mean to your supply chain? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, as I mentioned in the, in the talk as well, is that for us, it's not necessarily about just pure carbon emission reductions, it's because we're not on the we're not on the manufacturing side, right? So, and straight away when we start talking to people with regards to environmental impact, people kind of go, "Well, how much pollution are you creating into the atmosphere?" The atmosphere isn't just everything above ground level, and and it's becoming more of a discussion with regards to what's happening underground level. In other words, literally, what's the end of life as all things go to die? Right, and and we are. You would argue that companies such as ours and many of the many of the audience, no doubt, that are polluters, such to say that we're we're getting to a point where we we're introducing products and we're supplying medical products into into an environment that needs to end up somewhere. And what we're starting to find is that there's there's a lot more conscientiousness with regards to how can we better do this. And we're talking again end of life. So are we looking at reprocessing? Are we looking at reusability? I had an interesting discussion with one of the reprocessors over here, uh, actually uh, based more locally to us, that basically talks about the terminology around my product isn't reusable, it is just single use again. And you kind of go, what exactly does that mean? If it's single use, it's single use. But the terminology that actually does resonate in the systems that are being developed around this, which is if we can take a single use item we put it into the market and it gets used. Well, how are we able to reprocess that to still make it single use again thereafter? And it's an interesting mind shift that you ultimately have to be able to go, okay, it's not purely about manufacturing and production, about being able to move something into, you know, a sausage machine where you're feeding something in on the one side and it pops out on the other. It literally is more of a closed economy. It, it turns into a circular, uh, circular production point. We as industry, we need to be able to understand that. What does the model look like about potentially having to rebuy our own products two months after we sold it, right? Because the reprocessor suddenly becomes a new supplier. So it's, um, it's a challenge, um, you know, but one to be aware of because this is the way that certainly the younger generation is becoming more environmentally concerned is certainly going to be driving the, the future of, of healthcare. Yeah, that, that, that definitely interesting. And I think um, what, what we've seen some of those particular products being restructured, you know, after the, the end of life, essentially into other products, right? So, um, and, and, and various things and the reprocessing of that is, is, is definitely a, an area where I suppose, like you said, you're buying back from your suppliers again, right? So, yeah. That's, and that's right, you know, and that's and that's what customers want to hear. We are moving beyond the stage, and I think it's going to be global, where we're moving beyond the stage where we can just supply product. And, you know, and they're looking at us as leaders to be able to go, we have a solution for the back end of that. Um, we, as an example, we supply uh, patient services. So we look at mattresses in a simple term. 
And we're basically saying to hospitals, you know, are we able to supply a mattress? But on the back end of it, are we able to bring that mattress out of the hospital and manage that process so that it doesn't cost you anything? You can report on it on your environmental impact to your shareholders or whatever the case is. But in the background, we could ultimately get a company to be able to strip those down and create carpet underlays. So we're looking at cleaning, obviously, uh, decontaminating those particular mattresses, but how can we reprocess and repurpose the medical consumables? Uh, we were a large supplier of um, you know, other consumable stuff. We do uh, curtains, for example, disposable curtains. And one of those things, again, where we start seeing where we're able to work with reprocessors to be able to turn a curtain into a park bench that's at a kid's playground, you know. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So, uh, Anna, is there any questions? Um, or yes. Are we running out of time? Yes, um, I'm so happy to join this lively discussion and it's wonderful the insights you're giving us. But there are a couple of questions from our friends here. Uh, the first one, I'm not sure who can answer this, but could you share with us some upcoming healthcare or supply chain digital trends in 2022 beyond this year? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start off with that, but uh, go ahead. I think I've I discussed that within part of my slides, but it, it's the part of the robotics and 3D printing and how um, those particular changes are now moving to localization, right? So in, in the past, it's been sort of mass production in offshore uh, environments. Now with the, the way the supply chain is moving, Custom, uh, supply, you know, customers or our customers or businesses are moving to where customers are and building their infrastructures that, but reducing the cost by uh, by having the right automation in place, but also supporting that with the right data structures and our ERP system and everything else to support that. Wonderful. Thank you, Arthur, for giving us a sneak peek on what's to come in the next year. I have another question here. Uh, it says, with finite budgets at my disposal, how should investing in an ERP solution rank in my priorities as I look to improve my company's top line and also bottom line goals? That's a great question for Etienne, actually, seeing being, being a customer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, just reflecting back on our journey, it, it, I always say it's critical. You need to understand, you know, not where you are today, but where you're wanting to be. And, you know, it goes back down into those markets and forces that we, that we talk about. Um, and it's, it's, it's very important. I mean, the technological force that we start looking at and how that ultimately impacts the market that you're in. If you're in the supply game or if you're in the, in the, in the, call it the people business, in the labor side of it, you know, they, they're quite important. So I'd say it becomes a, a critical aspect um, that you need to consider having it grow with you as your business grows. Um, you do not want your technology to be your limiting factor uh, to your ability to grow. Um, so, so, so yeah, so critical. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Etienne, for that advice. Now, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the interest of time, I can only ask this one last question. If we get this far, do we have partners in the Philippines for our Filipino friends who are in the webinar? So I think, Arthur, you might be able to answer this. Yeah, sure. Look, um, Jacob Solutions essentially is a global organization. Uh, you know, we, we have presence in, in Australia, Philippines, Singapore, and in Thailand as well. So we're here to support uh, our customers across all of those particular regions. Now, especially in the Philippines, uh, we, we have a majority of our uh, center of excellence uh, experts sitting there and, you know, able to support our uh, Philippines friends. All right. Thank you so much, Arthur and Etienne. Wonderful discussion, gentlemen. So many great questions as well were coming in. If we didn't get to them today, don't you worry. We, you will be hearing from our expert solutions after the webinar. Any other uh, last minute things that you want to share, Arthur or Etienne? Oh, I, I just wanted to say yeah. a thank you. And I think just, just for the audience, look, um, my team and I we will be reaching out uh, to you. I, I look forward to having these conversations with um, the, the members of the audience. And if you've got more questions around that, we're happy to uh, take that on board as well. Yeah.
Yeah, and and likewise from my side. Appreciate that, and you know, it's it's great that you know you utilize technology to talk about technology, and uh, you know, which is yeah. which is very fitting. But um, you know, we we are in a changing we're in a changing environment. This is COVID isn't you know isn't new. We we've been with it for a while. We've got to look forward as to what's around the corner, and it's not just about how we are passengers on this as industry. We're ultimately we are the drivers. Um, and again, we are either affected by events or we can affect events, and uh, and we got to we got to stay ahead of that. But yeah, to your point, you know, if, if anybody ever wants to reach out or you know they're welcome to, I'm on LinkedIn. They've got specific questions or, or need to know how's happy to happy to have further conversation with people. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Arthur and Etienne. And with that, I would like to tip my proverbial hat to our two speakers for their expertise today. As you very well know, the medical supplies industries is an irreplaceable, irreplaceable component of the bigger web that is a healthcare ecosystem. Like the rest of the business world, the pandemic has dealt it quite a blow for sure. But unlike the rest of that world, we are fortunate to have been given the view of the future this afternoon, and it sure is looking bright. So if you want to keep abreast of the future and if you want to keep advancing amb ambition, don't forget to like the official Facebook and LinkedIn pages of JCurve. Drop us a line anytime and we'll be happy to respond, consult and collaborate with you. Also, just the last reminder, you have to scan the QR code to fill up the survey form and get the chance to win those gift vouchers from Amazon. We will let you know if you want anything via email. That has been truly an educational webinar. I'm sure it was for you. It was for me. And thank you so much for spending your time with us. We cannot wait to see you again next time. My name is Anna. Till then, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.